everybody. I'm Joe Hero, your host, and this is Somewhere Out There. Now we're going to delve right back into the book Missing Time by Bud Hopkins, but before we do I'm going to address one um, small detail that I over overlooked mentioning in the first episode. And that was, is that we're trying to find concrete evidence that may lead to us being able to unravel the alien agenda. And one of those pieces of evidence that I failed to mention was that, and these are very important any time an encounter is reported and researched, or even further important as an abduction that could be researched. And that's whenever there are physical evidences. One of those physical evidences that we had mentioned was um, lasting scars on the uh, abductees' bodies. And so these are actual physical evidences uh, amongst others. And one physical evidence that I had failed to mention in the Lani Zamora from Socorro, New Mexico case was that the alien craft had left imprints in the ground where its landing gear had actually set down into the ground. And not only that, but the four landing legs leaving imprints, that's one thing, but it had also left the brush burned in the vicinity with no apparent actual burning. So what uh, it would almost leave indications of radiation burns in the brush and on the grass in the, the area. That's pretty significant. And so we're going to go right back into Missing Time with Bud Hopkins and we're going to take a look at some more further hard evidence. Now keep in mind that the reason that I chose this particular book to begin with with our studies for the novice in UFOs was because we're going to look at some trends that we've seemed to notice in the UFO and abductee phenomenon and obviously missing time, a chunk of unaccounted for time that the victims uh, cannot recall frequently or if they can recall only partially. Oftentimes it is retrieved through hypnotic regression. And so uh, the time for this particular episode, November 1975, and the place is the Chelsea district of Manhattan, New York. Uh, 72-year-old George Obarski who just so happened to be a co-owner of a liquor store across the street from Bud Hopkins' studio at the time, is the person that we're going to examine in his unique case this evening. Here's how the story went about. He closed his liquor store at around midnight, which was typical for him, and he walked his dog through the neighborhood. He then headed home uh, after doing some paperwork, which was typical for wrapping up his closing of the store, at about 1 or 2 a.m. <clears throat> now, uh, as was his custom, he was driving north uh, to, uh, to North Bergen, New Jersey, where he lived, uh, via the, desert, uh, the deserted North Hudson Park. And uh, he was on his way to a 24-hour diner in Fort Lee. <clears throat> so what happened then was that his car radio started to have static, and it performed what he was describing as tinny sounds. It sounded tinny. Now, this electronics interference is number one for this evening. And that's number one as far as a noteworthy occurrence that we're going to see is repeated over many UFO experiences and reports. So electronic interference, that's number one that we're going to see. Uh, then a brightly lit, around 30 foot long, roundish ship with about one foot wide and four foot high windows. And this is also another common feature described by people who have similar unidentified craft um, encounters. Is we're gonna have see, we're gonna see as we progress here, is these rectangular windows along the outskirts of the craft. So um, that would be number two for this evening. Um, <clears throat> that craft followed parallel to him as he was driving slowly through the deserted park and hovered about 10 feet off the ground and it was making a humming or droning noise and the way that uh, this would be the third commonly reported um, trend when there's a craft encounter of this type is that humming or droning noise and it's reported commonly to be almost like a refrigerator running so 
um, the way that Bud had found out about this is that he had went typically, like he always did, um, to get his dinner wine from George on his way home and George had been very disconcerted. He was acting strange and he launched into a discussion kind of mumbling to himself about how things can come down from the sky and totally change what you might think of things. And he was complaining about his knee hurting. Well, he, uh, he did not know at the time that Bud was interested in this topic and so he had some customers to deal with and later on Bud agreed with him to come back later and get a full account and hence the story that he launched into here. Um, after the, the craft stopped and hovered, a door opened and a ladder-like apparatus emerged. And that was followed by approximately nine little three and a half to four foot beings that were uniformly clad in a light colored uniform. Um, and they had tight helmets on their heads. They emerged and um, it's interesting here is that Bud had noted that there was stark terror in George's expression as he recounted the incident. And this incident had happened 10 months earlier. Um, here in a single, single incident is that we find yet a fourth pattern that has emerged through the years from UFO researchers that they've noted. And that's, um, this has been documented time and time again, is that terror seizes the participant. Or shall I actually say the victim? Um, I'm here to put forth that that may be the case. And as we progress in our studies, I will clue you in on why I've come to that conclusion. Doesn't mean it's the case, definitely. But there is some, some reason to believe that. So um, these little beings carried what looked like a large spoon and a little bag with a handle each. And you know, without wasting any time, without wasting any energy, they determinedly disembarked the craft, dug around in the ground, and put the dirt in their bags and re-entered the craft, which subsequently ascended and made its way north. And the, and the entire encounter lasted less than four minutes, is what George had told Bud. And it shook George so badly that he went home and went straight to bed. He was too scared to even leave the lights on. We're talking about a, a, a man of 72 years, a street smart individual of New York City. And normally he would watch TV and watch the Late Show and have something to eat, you know, a snack or something at home. He was terrified and went to bed and put his head under the covers. So the next day, George went back to the site in the park terrified to confirm what he thought maybe that he was going crazy. He didn't even believe his eyes and that what had happened. It turned out that he discovered around 15 little holes about four to five inches deep in the sod, which he even placed his hand into to assuage his disbelief. And the result of this confirmation left him even more terrified than the encounter had. Now, there are elements in George's telling which Bud points out build a case for the veracity of this story. And this is important when research in this uh, phenomenon is conducted. That's number one. He left himself out of the events as he recounted the story to Bud. That means that he took a passive role in the whole affair, and he never claimed any of the little beings saw him. They didn't threaten him, and they certainly didn't give him any messages. And these are some of the things that some of the hoaxes that have been uh, debunked over the years, these, these are elements of those that, that can be unbelievable at times. But George made none of those claims. And he did, number two, he did not stress any definite or memorable face on the beings. And that's really important because he said that the helmets obscured their faces when Bud asked it if he could give a description of what the beings looked like. He said that he couldn't see their faces, and he described them as looking like snow-suited little kids. So um, he didn't uh, make a fabulous claim as to some horrifying being that, that had approached him or anything. He didn't do that. So number three is that he didn't take on any heroic role in the incident either. He stressed how petrified he had been 
and he told Bud that you just stopped functioning. Um, he even told Bud, you know, which is strange because although he was an acquaintance with Bud, he was not a good friend or, or per se, and he even did, uh, confided in Bud that he had hid under the covers that night and that he was just terrified out of his mind. Now, as the story progressed, um, after this, this telling to Bud, uh, uh, Ted Blecker, who is, was, is one of the main researchers in this field, he visited Bud and they went, together went to the site with George in the park and found approximately 15 of those um, scarred holes in the ground. Once again, that physical evidence, very important, but not even just important in itself, but that there was multiple witnesses to it. And they found about 15 six-inch diameter grassless patches on the turf where the supposed UFO landing had taken place. And which corresponds to what George had said about the little beings digging in the dirt, taking soil samples. Um, <clears throat> now, th these soil samples are not altogether uncommon either. So, many elements of this tale that that uh, George told Bud coincide with other cases that have been reported independently. And this is how researchers will develop a trend, and we're examining a few of those trends right now. So, Ted actually sent the soil, they took soil samples themselves from those uh, hole, uh, holes in the grass, and it turned out that afterward, it was found under lab analysis that none of those dirt samples had any root systems in them whatsoever. That means no roots from grass or any other uh, vegetation. Curious. Now the park custodian, when he was uh, interviewed by Bud and Ted, also verified that he had filled some maybe 15 holes, he didn't exactly remember, um, earlier, but he didn't know what had caused them. He had figured that maybe a dog or something had been digging in the grass in the park, and it was just his job to fix those holes. So he did indeed fix those sod holes, and still they remained dead to vegetation afterward. Now, uh, inquiry f into the matter further provided that a former night doorman, one Bill Pulowski by name, to a modern building called Stonehenge Apartments within the park, he reported a huge plate glass window in the front of the building had been shattered under unclear circumstances on a night that corresponded with George's story. Now that was, this is a very neat um, detail to this whole story because uh, um, Bill was hard to track down it turned out and um, it took Bud some time to get a hold of Bill in order to get the story out of him and the story was once again independently verified and Bud didn't tell the details to him how George had recounted his uh, memories of that evening. Now <clears throat> here's how he described and it turned out to be the same evening, verified, how that window had broke in the front of the apartment building. He had seen a bright light in the park, and he looked through this window in the front to see it better, and he was some thousand feet away from the craft, unlike George, who was driving slowly by, and at the closest was as, as far as only 60 feet from this craft. Now, Bill's viewpoint of the event took place from some thousand feet away and he reported a craft hovering about 10 feet off the ground with the same rectangular windows that George had observed. So many of the details were once again solidified and verified independently by a separate witness to the same event. Now he retreated from from seeing this occurring. Now he did not see the beings exit and enter the craft or go about their business. But then again, he was a lot farther away and he was actually down a hill, quite a bit of an incline from the event. So it's not surprising that he wouldn't have seen what was exactly going on. He just saw this craft hovering there about 10 feet off the ground. And he went to go use the telephone and call a tenant. And as he turned to use the phone, he heard a high-pitched vibration 
followed by a sudden crack. Now, here's some supporting details to this as well. It turned out that the next morning, it was discovered that a tree trunk had been broken in half in line of sight with that large glass window. It hadn't been before that, and Bill would, knew the tree well. It was a, a, a three branching out tree, and one of the major trunks was split in two in line with the window. And it also turned out that the police, observing the crack in the pane, found like what would appear to be a marble-like indenture with cracks propagating from it. So it would appear that an object hit the window. However, the police couldn't find or retrieve the actual object. Now, a police officer, Frank Gonzalez, who was a tenant of that Stonehenge apartment building, he witnessed an identical incident in the park six days prior to George's drive-by encounter, and when Bill uh, had encountered the broken window warning shot, perhaps, we could call it. And then, interestingly, a final con confirmation of separate witnesses of the same craft, identically uh, um, described, happened about two hours before the final landing was, and that was attained two months later. So two months after these interviews with George and then Bill, two months later there was another sighting of that same craft that had happened only when, when the time frame was placed two hours before that final landing. And that was from a 12-year-old boy named Robert, Robert Wamsley and his mother Alice. And um, Jerry Stroher had given a PTA group meeting and had just, uh, regarding the UFO topic when Alice had approached him and described these events where it was a unusually warm evening and they had seen this craft matching the description to what George and Bill had seen. And it was, they were only about 13 blocks from the site in the North Hudson Park anyway, where they were living at the time. And she said it was so unique that her and her son were running it down the street, watching it as it flew down the street, parallel with the street, and then it went off toward North Hudson Park. And, you know, she stayed in her bathrobe and she noted that, that she had been barefoot and it was an unusually warm night, thereby definitely confirming, because it had been only one evening that it was warm that month. Now, let's have a brief summary of this landing in North Hudson Park. The first step was that on Monday, January 26, 1975, it would appear that the ship scouted a landing site and was seen by Dorman Gonzalez. Next, at 9.30 p.m. Saturday night, it returned and was chased down the street by the Wamsleys. And lastly, five hours later from that incident, it was witnessed by George Obarski performing the soil sample mission, as it were, and fired a warning shot at Bill Pulowski while he watched it and was going to make a phone call to report it to a tenant in the building. So the, what is the conclusion that we can take from this case study? Well, here's what we can come away from it. Not only was there multiple witnesses to this event, independently confirmed, over the course of a couple months to retrieve all these witnesses, but there was about two hours of time missing that was unaccounted for in George's story from the time that he left his liquor store to the time that he, that he reported to Bud that he arrived home. He didn't even notice the discrepancy during the telling. This was something that later that Bud picked up on. Unfortunately, George refused to pursue the matter under hypnotic regression, and so regretfully, we will never know if there's anything more of the incident, but eerily, this may have demonstrated what could be an abduction. We won't ever know the, the answer to that, but it certainly sets the stage for multiple other reports that are similar, where, where there's a two-hour block of missing time or so. And another thing is that it, this, this encounter demonstrated these craft's flight capability that seems peculiarly to defy the physics of our dimension. And that's with very quick bursts of flight, 
Um, in typical UFO researcher protocol, Bud had discussed um, this event with the local um, airports to see if anybody had tracked anything on radar. And it turned out that there was no radar blockage or uh, uh, um, craft discovered that night, unusual on radar, but it also turns out that new radar capabilities are equipped with um, devices that make a disconnect between the display screen for the operator and the uh, actual equipment and what that does is it removes any anomalous readings so that things aren't picked up but this craft flew unusually low to the low to the deck and very quickly and also ascended extremely quickly and this is another um, very common occurrence with this type of sightings and lastly it demonstrated even back in 1975 that there was no more dark, lonely road encounters. This happened in the middle of a city with many witnesses. Something is happening.